everybody. My name is Drew Jablonowski with Garage Gurus. And today, you know, in these troubling times that we're having with coronavirus, I wanted to, to spend a minute and see if I could help, you know, educate you on maybe some of my diagnostic steps when, when I'm going and working on a misfire. So with all of us who are on flat rate, speed is the name of the game, right? And diagnosing a misfire, uh, it can be pretty troublesome, especially those P0300 random misfire codes. So today I'm gonna to do P0300 misfire step number two, and that's gonna be relative compression for me. Step number one, it's obviously verifying your customer complaint, right? So let's go ahead and get started on this, and uh, hopefully you guys will pick up one of my tips. So why relative compression, right? How can this speed up the diagnostic process for us? Well, whenever we're verifying a misfire complaint, you know, we have to verify the integrity of the engine. Do we have good compression? You know, do I have a valve issue, a leaking valve, a bad intake valve, bad exhaust valve, right? So imagine if we're working on one of these Chrysler 36s or one of these Ford EcoBoost engines with a 2735, whatever it is. Nowadays, you know, they're putting 10 pounds of crap in a five pound bag. It gets pretty doggone difficult to try and get to these engines, let alone work on them. So, you know, why use relative compression? Well, it's less invasive. We might not, we don't have the potential of damaging a component just to take it off just so we can test compression, all right? Can we utilize different scopes for this? Absolutely. I've used three different scopes uh, with relative compression. I've used the Pico scope, the Snap-on scope, and the Hand-Tech scope. I've also had some technicians tell me they've used the U-scope as well for it, and they've all worked. So the ones I'm gonna go over today for you are gonna be the uh, Snap-on scope and the Pico scope. So let's go ahead and get going. So relative compression using the snap-on scope is gonna be the first one we do. And there's two different ways that you can set this up, right? There's the low amps clamp, or you can use the test leads, all right? So remember when we're doing relative compression, all right, relative compression isn't gonna give us the exact PSI number of compression that we have in cylinder. It's just gonna show us what the compression is relative to the other cylinders that we have, all right? So with this one first, we're gonna go ahead and set up with the low amps clamp. Now, when we're looking at the low amps clamp with the snap-on, we're actually not using amperage, all right? It's actually producing a millivolt per amp scale, right? So 10 millivolts per amp is what we're going to be seeing. We wanna set it on 20 amp or 60 amp settings. All right, we're gonna go in to our scope and multimeter. Click on that, we're gonna click on lab scope. And then from here, we want four channel lab scope. You can see that there's low amp settings offered, but we don't wanna use those, all right? We wanna to go to the four channel lab scope. Now, when we go to the four channel lab scope, we like to use two channels, all right? Now, one channel we're gonna use for the relative compression with the amps clamp. And then the second uh, sink or the second uh, trace we're gonna use is gonna be the, the uh, ignition sink, all right? And the reason we're using this ignition sink is because if we have a P0300, it could be difficult to identify what cylinder it is that we are uh, looking at that is bad. So utilizing the ignition trace, it will give us an ignition pattern. And we know that when our ignition goes off, the cylinder is roughly at TDC or top dead center. So we know when we see that ignition go off once and we see it go off again, the engine has come full 720 degrees rotation. So we're gonna go up to the setup menu right up here at the top, all right? And we're going to click on that. It's gonna bring up our different traces. So trace one for our low amps clamp, we wanna click on the uh, two volt scale, test lead volts DC. We wanna put displayed all right, and then we wanna go ahead and put it on a filter. Some guys like to use a filter, some guys don't like to use a filter. Not using a filter can show a lot of the EMI that you might be picking up in the, uh, in the car. Um, so it's up to you what you're more comfortable with. And then we're gonna to go to our second trace here, and this is gonna be for our ignition source, all right? So we want to put it on whatever scale we're using. In this demonstration here, we actually have it on uh, two wire, coil, Ford coil, so we're putting it on a 50 volt um, scale. This 
uh, scope has an attenuator in it. If you were using a Pico scope later on, which we would see, you would have to put an attenuator on it. Now, if we're using a three channel or three wire, or four wire ignition uh, coil, you could probably put it on a lower setting, like 10 volts or 20 volts, whatever the, the amount of voltage gives you, because you're just gonna look at the signal coming from the PCM to that coil. And here you can see we put on the 50 volt scale. Now the time base, on the snap on the time base is what it is all the way across this entire screen. So we wanna have it set at one or two seconds because we want it one or two seconds to go all the way across the screen. Now some guys like to use you know, longer periods of time like five or 10 seconds. When you get into using relative compression with more diagnostic strategies like perhaps valve train issues, you might wanna look at it at a longer period of time and also use some sort of an in-cylinder pressure transducer or vacuum transducer. You know, maybe that'll be another tech tip that we'll have to you know, put out there for you guys. So set the sweep to one or two seconds uh, now. And then this is setting up the amps clamp here. All right, we can set it, we set it on 60 amps. We wanna go ahead and zero it before we clip it onto the battery cable. And it doesn't matter if you put it on the, the uh, battery negative or the positive. There is a polarity to the, um, the low amps clamp and you'll see, and it'll tell you which way to put it on. So the other way we're gonna do this is by using the actual test leads, right? So when we go to the test leads, it's, everything is the same setup, except when we get to trace one, we wanna invert it and we wanna go to coupling AC, all right? And now the reason we invert it is because we actually are maintaining yellow to power and we're black to ground, all right? So now we put our trace two, which is gonna be back probed in to the power lead or the control of the, uh, of the coil. And here's a great relative compression pattern. All right, when we're looking at it, we're cranking it over. All right, we wanna make sure that the battery and the starting uh, system uh, batteries fully charged, starting system's working fine. We don't want to have any issues with the starter. And we want to disable the fuel, all right, because this is a cranking test. What we're doing, guys, is we're actually watching the current that the starter takes or draws to pull the, uh, to turn the engine over. We've all, you know, turned an engine over by hand and it's easy and easy and easy. And then all of a sudden, once we're getting close to TDC, it starts to get real difficult. And then all of a sudden it gets easy, right? And that's what we're looking at here. Right here, we're turning the engine over. It's easy, it's easy, it's easy. And then right when we get to this peak, we can see our ignition is going off right at this peak. That must mean it's TDC. And that's when it's drawing the most amount of amps or it's the starter's taking the most amount of current to push that engine over, to turn that engine over. So we want this vehicle to have an ignition, but we don't want it to start. So we can disable the fuel on it somehow. Maybe it's disabling the uh, fuel pump. Maybe it's pulling the injector harness if you can get to it. Obviously with GDI, that's gonna be difficult. Um, some vehicles, you can put it in a wide open throttle. You can just hold the, the fuel or hold the gas pedal wide open throttle and it won't start, all right? We synced on cylinder number one. You can sync on any cylinder you want as long as you know the firing order. So you can see here, we synced on cylinder number one. We wanna look and see, are all of these relatively the same size to each other? Yes, yes they are. And then we can put the firing order out there. On this one, we can see, oh look, we're missing one. What cylinder is missing here? Well, if we know the firing order, we can see one, three, seven, two, six, five, four, eight. So here we identified that cylinder number two has something going on with it. Cylinder number two has no compression. Would no compression give us a misfire? Absolutely. So there's no need to check for injector. There's no need to check for spark right now because I need to concentrate on why I have no compression on cylinder number two. So now let's try relative compression using a picoscope. So when we're using the Pico scope, the easiest way to do this is by hooking up the high amps clamp, all right? So with the Pico scope, it's a little bit different because now when we're talking about the time base from one side to the other, the Pico has it in divisions, all right? 200 milliseconds per division would give us roughly two seconds um, across the page, right? 10 times two, there's 10 divisions on here. So we wanna set it for 100 to 200 milliseconds per division um, just for a nice relative compression check. 
We also have the luxury of checking amperage here. And when we're looking at our amperage, we want to make sure that we see 30 amps. If we don't have a minimum of 30 amps, we have a compression issue across the board, right? 30 amps is the minimum amount of amperage uh, needed to turn that engine over, or a minimum amount of uh, amperage per the compression that you have. And that's going to be our high amps clamp is going to be on uh, A, channel A, and then our ignition sink is going to be on channel B, all right? And then same with the snap-on. We want to make sure that the vehicle doesn't start. And how do we do that? Well, if we're looking at our ignition, once again, we have to take care of the fuel. And here, you know, it says throttle plates open, steady charge on battery, synced on number one. So here's a great pattern on the PicoScope. You can see they all look relatively the same size in comparison to each other. We have our firing order there of one, two, three, four, five, six. So we can lay our firing order out. We know that's one, two, three, four, five, six. So we can see that all six of these cylinders have a good compression to them. Now, one of the other great things about relative compression, we all know that our ignition current or ignition firing should happen, right? at TDC, or generally zero to 10 degrees before TDC is what we would normally see. So if that's the case, we know if the ignition firing is too far to the left, then our timing must be advanced. And if it's too far to the right of the peak, then our timing must be retarded. So now, by hooking up a low amps clamp to a battery, by back probing into an ignition coil and cranking the engine over, I can now tell that my timing is potentially off too far advanced or too far retard. Pretty amazing strategy and, and step here for the two, three minutes it takes you. You know, how long would it normally take to verify timing being on or verify it being off, right? Or taking a compression test. So here you go, here's an example of relative compression and we can see a bad cylinder right here. So this is looking at it from very far away and like some scopes, you can zoom in so we're gonna go ahead and zoom in here, and boom, there you can see that we have a cylinder that's low, and we can tell what cylinder it is because here's our ignition sink, all right? And you can see it's a pattern that's happening all the time. Oh, let me go back one here. Here's another one, right? So it's far away. Does this look like a good pattern? Well, it kinda does, but let's zoom in a little bit. When we zoom in and we look at our ignition sink, all right? When we look at our ignition sink right here, we can see there is like a little, a little hump right there. So now we go ahead and lay out our firing order. Oh man, look at that. Here's cylinder one, it's low. Cylinder two is high, three is low, four is high, five is low, six is high. And if we look at the ignition event, the ignition event is actually happening before that uh, current ramp or that ramp from the starter. So we could safe to say that more than likely we more than likely we have a timing issue on one bank being bank one because it's one three and five um, have to be low um, in their compression. There you go. You can see it highlighting it out. And here you go. Just for verification, went ahead and showed you. This is an old. Uh, Chrysler 35 engine here you can see and they're, what they're doing here is we're figuring out the actually degrees per teeth so we took the 52 total teeth on the uh, on the cog there we divide it by 720 degrees rotation which gives us roughly 13.8 degrees of timing per tooth that we have now I had a guy call me once and he had a 2008 Dodge Caravan, and he's a friend of mine. And if he's watching this, I'm sure I'm going to owe him a six-pack of beer for, for telling this story. But he calls me and he says, hey, Drew, I got a P0304. And I'm like, all right, well, why are you calling me? You've been a master tech for 20 years or whatever it is. I don't know. He's like, well, I got compression of 170 PSI on cylinder four. And then the other cylinders have 175 PSI. I changed the plugs, the wires, the ignition coil, and then I replaced the injector. That didn't fix it. So I went ahead and replaced the head gaskets, milled an x-ray of the heads, and did a valve job. I said, holy crap. And he's like, yeah, the, the misfire's still there. I said, well, I can see why you called me. Let's take a look at it. So the first thing I did, because at step one, I verified his complaint. Yep, P0304, you got a misfire on four. That is 100% accurate. And then I went ahead and I did relative compression. 
And so I did my relative compression there. You can see our ignition events that are happening here. And you can see right there, it's low. He's actually got low compression, but he said it was only 170 versus 175. So he went ahead and he showed me, and it was on his mechanical gauge, it was only showing a five PSI difference in compression. Now you can see this one here is a lot larger, and it doesn't mean this one has more compression to it. It's that the starter is turning the engine so quickly over here, and now by the time it gets to here, it's actually using more current because it went really fast and all of a sudden it got slowed down. So I went ahead and hooked up my WPS 500X, which is a different case study or tech tip that we'll do. And it shows me the compression digitally of that cylinder. And when I looked at the compression from the known good, uh, this known good had something like, let's say 175, but the bad one actually was over 20% less compression, which if we all know, if we have a difference of 20% of compression from one cylinder to the next, that could cause an issue with the uh, with a misfire, right? And in that case here, it was actually the lower half that uh, was was going out on them. So I just want to say, my name is uh, Drew Jablonowski. Thank you for your time. If you guys have any more uh, e-learning you want to do during this this period, you can go to garagegurus.tech, and uh, hopefully I'll be uh, coming back online with some of the other trainers, and we'll be able to give you some more awesome tech tips, a little bit longer than our normal ones, and. If you want any more information from us, go ahead and log into our, our YouTube channel. Follow us there. Uh, thanks for your time and be safe out there.